Joining me today is Alistair McLeod, Head of Research at Gold Money. Thanks for joining me today, Alistair. That's my pleasure, Tom. It's great to have you back because, you know, you, you've written a couple recent articles that really kind of take a take a step back and look at what could be, you know, viewed as a very pivotal time in history. So why don't we just start by talking a little bit about the metal specifically? How do we break apart sentiment in the metal space and what indicators do you look at to gauge sentiment? Ah, well, um, <laughs> I tend to look at the very, very big picture. I mean, most of the people, if you like, in sort of the gold bug community, you know, sort of worry about, um, you know, the day's performance or, you know, uh, what it's d doing, you know, between contract expiries on COMEX and all the rest of it. I mean, yeah, I do, I do follow that. But the thing that really matters, I think, is a far bigger picture. And um, I think the way I'd encapsulate that is by saying that um, the world is splitting into two, which was the subject of one of the articles I think you might have been referring to, uh, with uh, Asia as a whole, um, dominated by Russia and China, both of whom have accumulated very substantial gold reserves, not declared as reserves necessarily, but nonetheless in government ownership. Um, and so have uh, virtually all the um, those countries that are aligned with them. I mean, the, the members of the uh, Eurasian uh, Economic Union, for example, um, the BRICS uh, have been doing that. And even these Eastern European um, uh, countries, uh, part of the EU, like Hungary and Poland, have been uh, buying gold as well. Uh, so that is one side of it. The other side of it, of course, is the rest of us, NATO, if you like, America, UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. We've been doing absolutely nothing with gold at all. And um, so in a sense, I think that uh, the future, if you like, if you want to look at the really big picture, you've got to look at the future of the Asian continent and um, their geopolitical strategy and its likely success compared with ours. So that, I think, is probably the one thing which um, I would really define as uh, you know something tangible that we can argue about. And then, of course, there is also the background, and that is that um, we are uh, very definitely on the beginnings of a bank credit contraction. Now, that is very, very serious because if you look at GDP, um, you think GDP is the economic actions of everybody doing things which are included in the GDP. Well, in one sense, it is. But actually, the better way to look at it is it is the sum total of bank credit being deployed in the economy. So if you contract the amount of bank credit, then it doesn't matter what individuals are doing in the economy, basically GDP is going to go down. That's what we face. And um, the eventual consequences of that are bound to lead to more debasement of the fiat currencies uh, and um, potentially their final destruction. And so in that context, you look at gold and silver, they are the only legal form of money. And this was stated by J.P. Morgan himself in front of Congress in 1912. He said, uh, gold is money and all the rest is credit. Now, he wasn't you know, offering a matter of opinion. He was actually stating a legal fact, which is still true today. Mm -hmm. So if the currencies um, become debauched, which this, we're on a course for this to happen unless suddenly by some miracle we get politicians who will actually draw a line in the sand and say, no, we're not going to print any more money. We're going to control um, the quantity of money um, and we're going to um, ensure that um, there is some form of convertibility to stabilize its purchasing power. If that happens, wonderful. But I think that's like a snowball in hell's chance. <laughs> That's that's well put, Alistair. And you know, there's so much to pull apart there. But maybe let's start with that with that last part. Do you do you think that there actually is a case to be made for if we if we stop printing that we could actually reverse some of this damage? Or do you think that you know maybe in the in the U.S. dollars case that the debt is simply too high at this point to really 
be manageable without some type of of crisis or or debasement to actually bring purchasing power back to that currency well um I, it, it it can be done but um it's not just monetary policy in isolation um you have to look at uh, overall government policy and the degree to which government um plays a part in the economy that has to be reduced uh, and it needn't necessarily be reduced immediately but if there is a firm plan to reduce it over time then uh yes it is perfectly possible you must have the two things together because the source of monetary inflation is budget deficits i mean i, I would rule out just printing for the hell of it mm -hmm. but it's basically budget deficits that's that's the source of it um, the problem, I think, in pursuing that route is that you also destabilize the existing financial system, which is based entirely on fiat currencies. Um, you would, um, I think, uh, drive out an awful lot of businesses in uh, the economy, which rely on government subsidies, government help, government contracts, whatever it might be. So it's not a simple matter of just returning to sound money. And this is why I've always felt that this could only happen after a banking crisis severe enough to undermine the whole credibility of the government, therefore the credibility of the fiat currencies, and uh, force the uh, economic and political establishment actually to get real. Um, there is no sign of that yet. Um, I think we are on the verge of a crisis which will be triggered by the contraction of bank credit. I mean, when you look at the level of gearing um, or leverage, as I think I think the Americans prefer to call it, um, uh, in, on bank balance sheets, um, I mean, in the Eurozone, it's over 20 times. In uh, Japan, it is over 20 times. America is slightly more sensible at about 11.7 times. But that is still very rich very rich indeed. Canada, I think, is about the same from memory, but you've only got two GSIBs in there, which, which I track. Um, so we can see that um, with bank balance sheets so highly leveraged, that um, with interest rates changing, I mean, you know, the whole in interest rate environment has changed. We've, we've ended the long-term decline from 1980 to, well, last year. That's ended now. Uh, and um, we're now embarking on uh, an interest rate course, which is rising. I mean, you've only got to look at the rates of price inflation and current levels of interest rates to know that there is more in terms of interest rates rising ahead of us. So with that new environment, this brings in huge great risks for the bankers because they have been lending money to companies which simply can't afford um, a higher interest rate environment. So um, what do they do? They pull the plug on these companies. I mean, in many cases they will, and um, they will turn around to companies where they offer overdraft facilities and they'll say, um, we're withdrawing the overdraft facilities or we're cutting it back, you know, from a million to half a million or wherever it might be. So, you know, there are those things they can do. Um, that is going to have a major, major impact. And this is why it's so important to understand what GDP is. It's actually the total sum of bank credit circulating within the economy. That's it. It all comes back to bank credit. And if bank credit starts contracting, the economy is doomed. And that's basically what we're on the edge of.